Let's get joined up. Today's show is brought to you by Audible, and right now you can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash joined up. There's over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle or MP3 player. So thanks for tuning in to the Joined Up Writing Podcast, a regular show about all things writing, including interviews with authors, screenwriters and key figures from the publishing industry. Plus loads of hints, tips and inspiration for all creatives. You can follow us on Twitter at JU Podcast, leave a quick iTunes review or just tell a friend. Hello and welcome to the Joined Up Writing Podcast, where a little procrastination can go a long way. I'm Wayne Kelly and it's episode 145 with this week's guest, Jeff Noon, a writer with experience across multiple genres including science fiction, fantasy and more recently crime with his latest book, House With No Doors. Jeff has some inspirational stuff to say about dealing with adversity, writing from the inside and his mysterious two laws. All will be revealed in our chat. Before we get to that, a quick catch up from me. Like many of you at the moment, I'm currently working from home, taking on video editing projects as they come in, writing and recording more songs and recording lots of episodes of this podcast, the latter of which has been really pushing me to get back to my own writing projects. So many of my guests have had to overcome rejection, self-doubt and all the other challenges. But what it boils down to most of the time is that no matter what, they just keep going. And it's a theme that comes up again today with Jeff in uh, the interview. And it's clearly something that's been bubbling away in my subconscious because I recently wrote a song called I Can Never Hang On, which pretty much sums up something I see as a big flaw in myself, which is a tendency to lose momentum after a few rejections or challenges. I've done it with my crime novel, Safe Hands, which I subbed to maybe, I don't know, a dozen places, a mixture of agents and small publishers. I've had some positive feedback and some conflicting advice as to how I could possibly change the book, but essentially I'm yet to find the person who's just fallen in love with the main character and is passionate enough about it to want to bring my story to a wider audience. But let's be realistic, 12 submissions or whatever it is, is a pretty pathetic effort on my part. There are so many more places I can send it. But the truth is, like many writers, often when I sub my work, I'm already suffering from imposter syndrome and the belief that I'm just not good enough. So as soon as I see the first of those rejections when it lands in my inbox, the temptation is just to say, yeah, thought so. I'm not really a writer and I've been found out straight away. I know I'm covering old ground here, but I think it it bears repetition, partly because some of you may need to hear it and partly because I've got to keep reminding myself on a regular basis. I'm a writer because I write. Also, most, not all of the reactions, but most of them have been bespoke emails with specific feedback and lots of positive things to say about my writing. The consensus seems to be it's obvious you can write, but this story's just not for me. And many of my guests describe reading reviews of their work and only ever remembering the bad ones. And it's the same sort of thing. Why do we do that? Why don't we focus on the good feedback, the positive comments, and use that to keep the wind in ourselves and the words flowing? I just don't know. But I'm reminding myself and you again, keep writing, keep learning and keep pushing your work out into the world. Because in the same way you can't edit a blank page, you can't publish a book you haven't written yet. And the only way to guarantee your work doesn't find an audience is to never send it out there. So with that said, I pledge to have subbed my book to five more places before next week's show. Okay. What will you pledge or how will you change it up for 2021? Let me know by tweeting me at JU Podcast, emailing wayne at waynekellywrites.com or dropping me a line on the FB page. Also, don't forget to join the email mailing list at joinedupwriting.co.uk. It's totally free and you get a couple of downloadable goodies when you sign up and you'll be the first to find out about upcoming shows and events. Right, enough whinging from me. It's time for today's interview with Jeff Noon. So Jeff trained in the visual arts and drama and was active on the post-punk music scene before becoming a playwright and then a novelist, more recently moving on to crime with Slow Motion Ghosts and his latest, House With No Doors. His other novels include Vert, Pollen, 
automated Alice, Nymphomation, Needle in the Groove, Falling Out of Cars, A Man of Shadows, The Body Library and loads more. He's also published two collections of short fiction, Pixel Juice and Cobra Lingus. He lives in Brighton and House of Doors is out right now everywhere you can find great books. So enjoy the chat and I'll pop back at the end for the sign off. All right, Jeff, thanks a million for joining me on Joined Up Writing. Really appreciate it. So why don't we just start off just by you telling us, giving us a sense of where you're speaking from and, and, and how things are going at the minute for you. I'm living in Brighton. Um, I am I live on my own anyway, so I've been uh, tasked to different in the last year. I've been doing lots of work, uh, lots of writing. That's been my, been my main task. Playing some games like solo stuff. I like that. Well, that's good. What uh, sort of what board game type things you mean? Or yeah, I like Harkham Horror card game. Oh, right, I yeah. like leg- uh, Legendary Marvel card game. They're really good solo versions of them, so you can have a good time. Yeah. Well, that's good. Like deck builder type things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. I know. I'm a bit. I, I I haven't got those particular games, but yeah, I'm, I like board games, so I sort of know where you're coming from yeah. with that. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I love. I like. I like to build a good deck. <laughs> yeah, well, you've had plenty of time with what's been going on, yeah. anyway. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Well, all right. Well, start off by telling us about your so your new book, House with No Doors. Yeah, this is my second crime book. Uh, so I'm I'm known if I'm known at all as being a science fiction writer mm-hmm. uh, and a fantasy writer. Um, so. Uh, a couple of years ago, I published my first crime novel, Slow Motion Ghost. House with No Doors is the follow-up to that. So this is a bit of a new thing for me, really. Mm. I'm uh, going off on a slight tangent Go to what it. I usually do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've always been, I've always loved crime novels. Okay, okay. and crime novels are the, are the main things that I read. Yeah. As a as a reader, I, I very rarely read science fiction or fantasy. Uh, I like horror and I like crime. Those are my main two. So I've always wanted to have a go at writing one. But usually, um, because the way my imagination works, I usually get these ideas and they usually get quite weird very, very quickly. <laughs> and they, they naturally kind of end up in the science fiction and fantasy realm. But uh, every so often I'll get another idea and I think, OK, OK, that's quite interesting. That, that might be good might, in the real world. You might be able to rein it in. Yeah, rein it in. Yeah, <laughs> just have a look. <laughs> real people doing real things and uh, just see how it happens. But I'm mean, very interested in, in adding my little particular take to it. So I do bring a little bit of or little bits of things in uh, themat- thematically. Uh, they're absolutely the same. They they follow completely and utterly my favourite uh, like overall themes, you know. So that's different. That's so that's that's absolutely the same. There's no difference there. So yeah, a, a little bit different, but uh, coming from a a very personal place in me in terms of an absolute passion and love for the murder mystery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well give it. Well, give us a sense of the premise of House with No Doors. Then, so what's uh, what's the setup? The setup here is that uh, and, and Inspector Hobbs, who's my main character, they they uh, they go to a house where an old man has killed himself, uh, and in the living room they find this dress, a lady's dress, and it's all set out on the floor with a scarf and some stockings, um, and there's a cut in the dress on the like, on the midriff, and there's been blood stained around it. There's no explanation for this at all. This man has lived alone for many, many years, okay? When they search the house, they've actually find a good number of these dresses. The same dress is just colour, all with this cut in them or tear at the same place and all marked with blood or with a blood substitute like red paint or ketchup, etc., yeah. etc., et or lipstick and so on. Uh and Hobbs becomes absolutely madly and utterly obsessed with this thing. He's absolutely determined that this dress is symbolic of a woman who's been killed in some way. It may, may be murdered. Uh, and it drives him completely nuts, basically. <laughs> so it's, it's like 
what does that dress mean? Is it what does it stand for? Is it does it stand for a real woman? And he's, he tries to track down this woman who might in the past have worn this dress and who might or might not be dead. Brilliant. So it sounds like a, an entertainingly disturbing and dark. So can you uh, yes. can you remember what kind of sparked the initial idea? Um. Yeah, I can. I I tend to like, as, as I'm sure, like most creative people, I gather things over years and years and years, and I file them away. I used to write them down, but I don't these days. I just like put them in my mind, and that's it. And every so often, they just come back up, and they click with something else, you know. Yeah. So I was fascinated by this. Um, you probably know it, the uh, the famous uh, true crime case of the Bella in the Witch Elm. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know Bella in the Witch Elm. Yeah. yeah I mean. I, I can't remember all the details, but yeah, I think it was just after the Second World War. I think some kids found a a skeleton in the ball in the in the, the hollow trunk of an elm tree. Uh, it was a, a woman's skeleton, and to this day, she's never been identified. No one's ever come forward. There's been various theories put forward as to who she might be. But nobody's absolutely, you know, proving it. Uh, and and then graffiti started to appear uh, on in the local town near where this tree was. I think it's near Birmingham. And um, the graffiti said, who put Bella in the witch helm? And it appeared on, like, the war memorial and various other places. So that added an extra layer of meaning to it mm. in terms of, like, it, does someone actually know that this woman is called Bella? Yeah. No. <laughs> so it's been, when I read about that, and I, I, I thought I was quite intrigued by that. Now, I know that quite a few crime novelists have been influenced by this as well. So I never want to actually do the thing itself. I always want to take something as a metaphor, yeah? Yeah, and build and on And then that. just push it. Yeah. As far as I can into something strange and weird. Not as weird as in my current science fiction, but <laughs> you know, it just into some new territory. So I took that basic idea and I became fascinated with this idea of the missing the woman who can't be identified, the corpse that can't be identified. Okay. Who over years, over many, many years. And I and I, I saw that the skeleton was like a symbol of the woman, and I just thought. What if it wasn't a skeleton that was a symbol of the woman, but something else? Mm. But something that seemed to imply that she was was dead or been murdered or whatever. And, and then I came up with this idea of the dress with the symbolic wound on it, which is repeated. I think it's 28 dresses altogether they find, the final count. Mm-hmm. In the house. So something obsessive has been going on here. And then it all turns out, as Hobbes investigates, that it's to do with this old man and his family that have lived in this house for many, 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 many decades. And the madness of that family. It's quite gothic, mm. in a sense, uh, in, in the darkness of that family and the, the kind of hermetically sealed family that's what it is it, it's very difficult for the family members to break out of it and they're all influenced by a certain event that happened in the past that led to these dresses being a necessary part of their culture so so yeah i i start from from a true crime case meta turned it into a metaphor and then solidified it into this particular story uh, I, i'm making that sound like i just did that but it took quite a while of course you know, yeah and, and a lot of writing to discover because i write to discover uh, yeah, rather than writer. planning yeah I, yeah i write to discover so that so it was quite interesting there's a whole bunch of stuff you know it's all gone uh, in there yeah it's all gone in there. And then the other thing was the great, um, there was an exhibition at the Wellcome Institute in London mm-hmm. Gallery. Uh, and it was about forensics, the history of forensics. Um, and in that, in that exhibition, they had these amazing paintings. It's going to bring this up, get the word right. I can't pronounce the word properly. It's a Japanese word. Kuzozu. Mm-hmm. Kuzozu. Uh, and this is the study of decomposition. Right, and it's linked to like a Buddhist practice. Uh, it was popular between the 13th and the 19th centuries, uh, and then artists would paint pictures of the human body in various states of decomposition. <laughs> it sounds really horrible, I know, but they're actually <laughs> things of great, great, great beauty when you look at them. You know, there's one called the body of a courtesan in nine stages. Uh, 
uh, and then there's the death of a noble, but of a noble, a noble lady and the decay of her body. They're usually nine or ten stages, and they just portray. So what they would do, the Buddhist practice, you would put a body out in the woods somewhere and just let it rot naturally, mm-hmm. not bury it. Mm-hmm. So nature takes it over. Okay. Now we're very squirmish about this. You know, but in fact, it's just nature doing its thing. And I suppose from a site, si- obviously, I mean? yeah, and obviously from the study of forensic <laughs> side of things, it's it's really useful because you've got this, you've got these records of how it, people did. It it's just like the the famous, oh God, I can't remember, the body farm, you know, that the FBI have out in, in America somewhere. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's this body farm where they leave bodies to decay mm-hmm. in, in different kinds of situations so, they so that they can it. study when certain insects arrive, you know, what's, what, what happens when you put somebody in a wheelie bin mm-hmm. uh, and so on. Uh, and so it kind of ties into that. But also it acts in terms of the Buddhist belief, I think, just reading this, that it's about also like a memento mori that because um, people would go out and view it. Right. You would go into the woods and every sort of you could go and look at it. <laughs> it sounds mad, doesn't it? it does. But you know, it's that it's that nature taking over the human flesh again. There's nothing we're squirmish, but we shouldn't be really because it's just, just nature a doing cycle. its job. Yeah, it's a cycle. cycle. Yeah. And it was seen as a, a perfectly respectable thing for for an artist to record this process in these nine paintings. So that was another thing that went in. So I'm making this book sound really horrible. I know that, but there's a lot of kind of. <laughs> decay and decomposition and that turns into what i just said about cotard's delusion the walking corpse corpse Mm. syndrome you know that they uh, how does somebody's body decay if they're not actually dead but they believe they are decaying oh man i tell you (laughs) i had uh yeah it's it's fun it's dark many yeah many a, a fun night writing that (laughs) (laughs) so as you say with these with these latest two books they've both been the henry hobbs books yeah uh, they've been you know very firmly rooted in the crime genre but the i know you you mentioned you did speculative fiction sci-fi and uh fantasy type stuff but the two novels that were before this they i know they weren't tr- uh, crime in the traditional sense but because they were kind of sci-fi but they still yeah. featured a private eye didn't you didn't they John yeah i'm actually Nyquist. just uh, i'm actually on my fourth one it's coming out later this year the fourth one it's the nyquist mysteries That's it, uh, yeah. nyquist is a private eye um and there's their science fiction and fantasy novels. They uh, the, the the basic thing with those novels is that every book is in a different city mm-hmm. or a different location, and each location has a very specific thing about it. Mm. Okay, which is tied in with the crime that he's uh, that he's investigating. You know, so in the first book, A Man of Shadows, he's living in this city where night and day are uh, not to do with time but to do with space that mm-hmm. it's the city is completely lit all the time and if you want to go to night you have to travel to night and the second book the body library everyone's fascinated with storytelling mm-hmm. you know, uh, and bringing stories to life in different ways and again there's a crime that involves that the third one creeping jenny he goes to the countryside into a it's a bit like a folk horror mm. novel that one um strange doings in a village and the fourth one, it's like a city that's filled with a million different borders, like diff- all the many different kinds of borders that you might have to cross. Mm. Uh, and he it, it, it ends up... So, yeah, every time a different city... So that's that's the great beauty of them for me as a writer is that it's always new. He's never stuck in one place. He's always got some new madness to face every time, you know. And I suppose that's yeah, the Yeah, but thing they are it. private eye. Yeah. And, and they do come out of my love for that genre as well. Uh, and when I write those, I'm very much keen into... Oh, my favourite uh, private eye uh, novelist is I think Ross MacDonald, mm-hmm. um, who was a uh, golden age. It's kind of slightly post post Chandler, but definitely in that noir American noir golden age. Yeah, the very kind of weird family dramas. I love all that. Mm. And so, have you found like moving into the, the doing so doing the Henry Hobbs stuff? Did you find well, first of all, when you wrote the first Henry Hobbs, did you? Th- did you write that with a view in mind that this was going to be another series? You thought, right, I'll come up with a central character that I can maybe carry on to a thing, or was it just a case of you just wrote that book and you just saw how it went sort of thing? Okay, I'm going to tell you how I write books now. Yeah, okay. go for it. Yeah, okay. So uh, I, I got the central idea for Slow Motion Ghost, the first one, mm. which is about um, – I tend to focus on these weird little syndromes and that. That one's about paracosm. paracosm. 
And paracosm is the human ability to create and become fascinated by imaginary places. Okay. And it really refers to people um, who obsessively build imaginary villages for themselves. Right. right. Uh, uh, and uh, this, so when I wrote that book, it, I knew it was going to be set in like, the, like rock and roll, and I knew it was going to be set in the past. Mm-hmm. And I wrote the whole thing from a, from a certain character's point of view, right? Who mm-hmm. wasn't a detective. Right a character in a drama and, and I sent it to people and nobody was really picking up on it you know I mm-hmm. sent it to my friends my agent etc but they all said one thing they said when that when that detective seemed interviewing her in the room yeah we really liked that a bit and like I think three different people said that right. so I thought have I got this completely wrong is this <laughs> like you chose the wrong central character <laughs> yeah is this actually more of a standard police pursuer with a detective mm. So I rewrote the whole thing from his point of view, and he became Henry Hobbs. So that's really typical of the way I work. Well, I'll go down a certain role and suddenly realise, oh, hang on. Ah, now I need to jump, you know. That's the discovery process. <laughs> but but it sounds like, obviously, because you've written loads of books, and so it's obviously yeah. something that works for you. So did, w- did you find that when you first started writing, did you find, was that like a bit scary? Was that a bit like, oh, oh I messed <clears> it up? Uh, or was it okay, or is it something that you lean into now and you sort of well this is how I work and I know that I'll get there in the end yeah I, what I do is uh, I have these two laws in my head yeah I invented them when I was young like 19 early 20s and I follow those two laws so it's when I invented them when I was a pet when I was into painting they govern everything I do mm-hmm. everything okay so, uh, and if you want, you can search the, the, the internet. You can find me talking about these things. But the, uh, I don't mention them very often, okay, because they're a bit embarrassing, to be honest. If I just <laughs> said them to you now, boldly, you wouldn't be that impressed by them, but they work for me. Well, you that's see? what's important, though. That's yeah. important, yeah. So, um, what were we talking about? So, yes, so two I, rules, yeah. Yeah, two rules. So, I've always got those, and they drive me forward. All the time. So I don't have any fear when I write. I know a lot of people have fear of writing, you know, or even starting sometimes. People have said this to me, you know, people who want to write, but they have this kind of fear. So I always say, just write, just get it down. And then, you know, it's really about putting the ego aside, isn't it? The ego Mm. has to just just put that aside. Don't worry if it's good or bad. Just write and see what happens. And it might well be that you come up with something that's quite interesting. And then if you get something that's interesting, just go along that direction. Just see what happens. Find the best bit. Explore it even more and so on. Uh, I suppose that's what I'm doing. But I have over the years obviously become quite experienced of plotting uh, as I go along. So obviously with a Nyquist novel, I can just come up with a situation of like a weird city. Mm-hmm. Put Nyquist into it on a job and then see what happens. And I will just follow where Nyquist goes. And he usually takes me to very interesting places. With the crime novels, with Hobbes, it's more difficult. You can't really do that because when you're writing a crime novel, a, a traditional crime novel, you're really writing two plots at once, aren't you? Yeah. Uh, so it's sort of the, need to know roughly where you're going. Yeah, there's there's the there's the story that you're that the reader is reading on the out. That's like the external story, and inside is the hidden story, which is mm. what's really going on. So I find with the that kind of thing. If I've got that hidden story right in my mind, or I can work out on paper, and that usually to do, is to do with events in the past, I can just let Hobbes discover clues. So I don't have to know where Hobbes is going to go each, from chapter to chapter. He can I go just down to... the normal dead ends and red herrings. And yeah, all that. yeah, as long as he's somewhere around that central story, but not quite getting it, you see what I mean? Yeah. Or learning little bits about it every so often. And of course, then in the you know, in the final chapters, those two stories come together, don't they? That's mm. the great moment yeah. in a murder mystery. Yeah. Where that hidden story is suddenly, you know, in the classic kind of a Christie kind of way, it's yeah. suddenly like revealed and it's like, yeah. oh yeah. Wow, I did not get that. <laughs> <laughs> so so what are the you you can't tease us yeah. now. So you've said that you've got these two rules. What are the two rules? <laughs> I just said that they would sound really bad. That doesn't what? matter. Go for it. You can't. You can't just set those up and then for not, not tell me. 
<laughs> for me to do it properly, okay, I've kept these two rules secret for a very long time, okay, for like 40 years. Okay, wow. 40 years, yeah. Right. Now, I, I was given an opportunity a few years ago to do a lecture for young people who wanted to learn to be writers, you know, yeah, like teenagers, yeah. Like, even younger. And I thought when I was doing that, it was quite a big event, and I thought, uh, why don't I just talk about those rules, you know? So I did that. So that was the first time I ever told people about them. For me to explain them, I've re- I would really have to – it would take me half an hour because <laughs> I have to tell you the story of my life, <laughs> right? Because what's important about them is that I'm like 63 now, right? Yeah. I would never, ever, ever come up with these two, law- these two laws. I'd never do it. They're the kind of laws that a young person has to come up with because they're quite <laughs> mad and quite arrogant and quite filled with the, you know, the glory of youth <laughs> and all that. And like, yeah, I don't care. I'm just going to do this. You know what I mean? But they work whereas, whereas now I'd be like, yeah, no, that won't work. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but I've still kept in my mind. So there's a little part of me is always like 19 or 20 years old, which is quite good. Um, they're basically a way of always being they're very they're, they're about being conscious all the time okay mm-hmm. so you, they're not like rules that are like subconscious they know mm-hmm. i'm asking my mind is filled with them and i'm constantly doing them all mm-hmm. the time every second mm-hmm. you know if i pick up a guitar and start to play i'm doing them then mm-hmm. now they 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 act in a kind of way that the that they the two laws and they are laws you have to follow them Okay, yeah, I like that rules. you call them laws, not rules. Yeah, 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 yeah they are laws, yeah. So they, they slightly contradict each other. <laughs> okay. So one of them is telling you to be brilliant yeah. and mad and crazy and just do it and, you know, and just be as crazy as you can. The other one is telling you to give the audience unique delight and pleasure. All the time. You see yeah. what, now, you see what even I'm saying to me, it sounds like incredibly arrogant and all that. No, it but, doesn't. No, it doesn't. You know, because no, I don't think it does. the kind of stuff I was thinking about when I was young, you see. That's why it's a bit embarrassing now. But because they, they contradict, because one say, do you just, do you, do you just go man, you one say, no, no, audience storytelling. Like that. And so because of that, they almost act like a kind of... Um, yeah, but I think like, you could... Like, hang on a second. They're like a kind of um, a perpetual motion machine. It's like you're rolling downhill. Mm. Yeah, because... First one, do this. The second one, no, do this. First one, do this. No, mm. do this, and so on. So mm. that gives me quite a lot of drive. So it's quite easy for me to write mm. in that way, which I'm driven. Yeah. Now, while it's not doing this stuff, is it's it's. Uh, I find that I reach a certain point, and I'm kind of I can just improvise. But I reach a certain point about say three quarters of the way through, okay, mm-hmm. where suddenly I'll stop. And I'll know I've reached that point. I said, now I have to really work, okay? And I have to work out what's happening, what's really going on here. In a crime novel, you know, traditional mm. crime, you really have to do that. Mm. The Nyquist book, I don't have to do it so much, but I still have to do it. It has to still make sense. Mm. And so I do like three or four weeks' work, which is really intense and is doing, involves lots of diagrams and lists and writing on paper and working out just what's going on, okay? Mm-hmm. Once I've done that and I'm happy with it, I can then roll downhill to the end of the novel. Mm -hmm. That's the basic process that I use. And I use that all the time, that process. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there you go. No, I I don't think, I don't think it does sound arrogant anyway. (laughs) I think, I think it sounds that, I think it sounds like any artist, whether it's a musician or it's a painter or whatever, because if, you know, if you think about any great, uh, bands or musicians or anything else it's yeah y- you know, well if you think particularly in like pop music uh yes you know pop when pop music was you know good um it, but but if you th- you know think about it it's that whole thing about you're trying to find something novel that sounds yeah. a bit fresh and that's not been heard for a while or or whatever but at the same time you, you want it to sell and you want it to connect with people and you want it to mm. say something to people, and you want it to have a certain universality. So I think I think you can apply it to <clears> lots of things like that. But as I say, yeah. you want to break new ground, and obviously there are artists that that's all they do. Um, they, they you know all they're bothered about is they just want to break new ground, and they want it to be completely different to anything else. But then, you know, maybe they don't connect to as many people, or they don't sell as many records, or whatever, however you want to put it. Um, so I think you're right. I think there is finding a it's finding the balance in the two things. I think. You do need to 
it's it's a bit like the the whole first draft and um, re-editing process. I think it's Stephen mm. King or somebody that says, you know, you write he writes his first draft with the door closed, and then he yeah. and then <clears> for a second draft he opens the door and that's when he thinks about who's outside the room. You know, who else is going to re- be reading it? But that first draft is for him. Yeah. So I'm doing that, but I'm doing it every second. Yeah. Swiftly from one to the other, following these two laws in my head, which won't shut up. That's how you keep momentum. Yeah, but that's how you keep your momentum going. (laughs) (laughs) That's how you can keep your momentum going. So on, so on that kind of uh, sin, as we've kind of touched on it, and you mentioned, you know, these laws that you came up when you were younger and stuff. Let's take a step back a little bit then. So tell us a little bit about your your background, where you grew up, and kind of what your earliest memories of, of writing were. How you got into writing in the first place. Yeah, so I was born in uh, in uh, Manchester, in Lancashire, actually, born in Lancashire. Um, and I, I started writing, I think, I, I was always really into, like, painting and that when I was a kid. I was good at that. So I ended up doing art, le- art A-level. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, there was one of the teachers there was this uh, this guy who was, and I started to write. I started to write very bad poetry, basically. Mm-hmm. And I gave these poems to him. Uh, it was a tutor, this A level, you know, and he mm-hmm. was like, uh, and he said these are really good. And he said, why don't you come along and and, and read some of them at this night that I organised? He organised a night above a pub in Ashton Underline where I was living. So I said, oh, okay, but I didn't, I couldn't imagine me standing up and reading my bad poems, my bad teenage poetry, you know. <laughs> so I thought I need to do more than that. So I thought I'll I'll turn them into a story. So I came up with this, concocted this little story that linked these poems together into a little narrative. Mm-hmm. It lasted about 20 minutes altogether. And people really seemed to like it in mm-hmm. the audience. So I was taken aback by that. And I thought, oh, okay, there you go. There's a thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. And like, um, I think I was about, yeah, I thought I was probably 19 at times, something like that, just when the laws were being invented. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, so that was my first start. Then I ended up, doing uh studied drama uh ba uh drama and painting and did like a combined arts thing and at the end of that process i decided that i wanted to be a writer this would be 1984 when i left college <clears throat> and i started and what i really wanted to be was because i was in drama i wanted to write plays so there was a number of years when i wrote plays i had some success with my first play then I had lots and lots of rejection slips with my second play. I desperately could not write a second play to save my life. Mm-hmm. After having a play on at the Royal Exchange yeah. in Manchester, you know? Yeah. And that's that's my years of rejection slips. Um, that must have been little, pretty hard after getting yeah, that I got a little early bit despondent. success. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I think in the early 90s, I ended up working at Waterstones Bookshop in Manchester, which had just opened at the time, probably late 80s or 90s I was there. <clears throat> and uh, the assistant manager there was one, a very good friend of mine, and uh, we were kind of plotting our escape from the bookshop one day. You know, we have to get out. We, what could we do to, you know, <laughs> further our careers and all that? Um, otherwise, I'm going to end up running a, a bookshop or something, which I would love to do, but, you know, I had other ideas as yeah. well. And, um, he said, I'll tell you what, he said, Come back to me. No, he said, give me two weeks and I'll get back to you. Okay, so he got back to me. He said, okay, Jeff, I want you to write me a novel. And he'd, he'd set up his own publishing company, called it Ringpool Press. <laughs> and he published, and he, he just told me, and I had this half-finished play. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I just took that half-finished play and I turned it into this novel, Vert, my debut book. Mm. Uh, and he published it. So it was published by a tiny little publisher in Manchester. It went on to win the RC Clark Award. And that's really the beginning of my career then. Um, we wrote it. Like I would write a chapter, give it to Steve, the, the guy there. And he would edit that chapter. And then I'd write the second chapter, he'd edit the second chapter. Mm. <laughs> until about halfway through that I kind of worked out how to do it. And then I kind of just did it and that was it. Well, that's great. So yeah, I was and, and and so almost by accident I found myself in the site in the world of science fiction, really. Yeah. And so that's just kind of where you landed, as you say, you kinda of got the success with that first novel and then yeah. you're off to the races, yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. And so what did you what what do you think you kinda of, I mean, obviously that's when you were kind of formulating your two laws and everything uh, as well. But what what else do you think you learned from that time? When you, you said you sound like you were picking up editing and stuff like that. Was that kind of way you learned how to do it, do you think? 
Um, I think every time you write a book, you get a little bit better, or you hope that you do, even though that they might not necessarily be a great book that you've written. You're still processing technique, aren't you? Yeah, you're learning all yeah. the time. You know, uh, I mean, you can dip in quality, but you should be getting better technically. You should be learning stuff and becoming more of an expert, so you you can uh, you learn out about storytelling. It sounds a bit mad because human beings always tell stories, tell stories, but there are different ways. And I was really interested in finding it different ways. At one point, I was really influenced by like dance music because it was the whole rave culture and all that. And I mm. was remixing stories and everything. This would be like late nineties, that Same, kind of era. A needle in the groove and stuff. Even like in the groove, yeah. all that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, and kind of came out of that. I, I disappeared for about six years uh, when I desperately tried to break into the world of screenwriting and failed Mm -hmm. and uh, came back and started again. So it's really funny, but I've actually had two careers in a way in in terms of novels because I put out about nine books, I think, Mm -hmm. and then just went away. And in that period, you know, if you go away, you're done unless you're like super, super, super famous. So I then had to, I came back and I had to build it up again, one book at a time, you know, um you never give up um just hang on just keep going keep going and just you know try to connect to people try to tell stories that people that you think people want to read that if that excites you you know you might excite other people and all that stuff but yeah you keep going trying to find a voice i've always been into that the process of that a writer should have an individualized voice of some kind yeah no, so a lot of writing is about discovering that voice for yourself. And it might be that you discover an incredibly individualized voice, or it might be that you're happy working as a variation in a theme that other people are exploring. They're both valid, you know, but in that, you do need to find that voice. So, um, yeah, long answer. <laughs> no, but no, but it's, it's a good answer. So, so when you, obviously, as you say, you kind of moved from this kind of the speculative stuff and the, the fantasy sci-fi type stuff into what you know some people would call more traditional crime or whatever. Were you kind of were you worried about that? Was it something? Has it been tricky to educate readers and publishers and stuff that you kind of moved into that different genre, or did you yeah. not? Did you not think about it like that? I didn't think about it. Obviously, the crime books do end up in the science fiction section, you know. Uh, yeah. Um, I did toy with doing it under a pseudonym for a time. Yeah, I wondered but, that. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, they were different. They they are different. They mm. the language is different. In in my science fiction novels, I'm much more kind of crazy and mad, and you know, in these books, I really like tone that down a little bit. Although there's an element of it, but I really like in these books to explore my pure storytelling thing, which I love. You know that whole around the fam, around the campfire, telling stories to each other kind of aspect of human life. So that's very interesting to me that I can have, if you like, two two things on the go at the same time. One of which is satisfying a certain area of my brain. The the other one is doing satisfying a different area in my brain i find that's quite interesting um yeah comes back to you too so it thing. is i mean it is difficult it, it is it is it will always be difficult if you if you're established for a number of books in a certain field mm. and you suddenly do something else yeah it can take a while did, did, did you find when you were pitching the book you know whether it was to your agent or to publishers or whatever <clears> was that something yeah. you you kind of had to overcome or did you even did, did you even address it or was it just a case of look this is the, the this is the new book that i've this is the latest book that I've, I've got out you know have a look at it it was a real passion project of mine it took quite a minute you know it took a while from the very first moment i got the idea a good number of years passed mm-hmm. before i started thinking about it in terms of getting in front of a publisher so uh, to be honest it was incredibly lucky i just i didn't have to send it to anyone i I went for dinner with one of my old editors and i said to him um oh by the way i've got half of a crime book he said well send it to me i sent it to him and he said i want the rest (laughs) so you know it was just like okay there you go and that you know so i finished it and uh, that's how it that's happened i was really lucky if i hadn't have gone for dinner with him you know what i mean that wouldn't have happened at all um so 
yeah, I think some people just like a good crime book like me. That's what they want. You know, and publishers are the same. You know, it's it's a different thing entirely. I mean, and I have a, it's like with my crime, my science fiction, like the Nyquist novels mm. are with a specialist sci-fi mm. fantasy publisher and they're like an indie press, you know, and they really know how to work that world and how yeah. to sell books in that world. Yeah, that's, yeah, Ang- with Angry Robot, yeah, they're kind of really good at that speculative fiction stuff, aren't they? They really are. I'll tell you the story, right? Yeah. This is, this is, so any writers out there who think that they're ever going to give up, okay. I was, <clears throat> this sounds like a bit of a sob story, but obviously, you know, I was having a bit of a difficult time, mm-hmm. okay, like financially and everything, my career wasn't really happening, etc. I didn't have an agent at the time. Mm-hmm. So I was, I was pretty down and I don't tend to get down because I'm very resilient, but I was struggling a bit, you know, and, and um, I was on Twitter one day and this guy came on and he said, I really, I really wish that Angry Robot or Galance would publish a new trilogy by Jen because I would really like to read it. Okay. Wow. So I sent back a two word tweet to that guy saying, if only. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because I was really poor at the time. Yeah. And uh, I wasn't having any success at all. And God bless the Angry Robot sent a tweet saying, yeah, we'd be interested. Yeah. Because they're so I, familiar with I had other this. Stuff. I said, you know, I've got this half finished book, Command of Shadows. Private Eye, Weird City, send it, and they loved it, and they published it, and that was that's how it happened. But, you know, it's just that sometimes you just hang on and you never stop, you never give up. And something always happens, I've found, you know. But the key, I think and it the can key, be the, the tiniest thing, thing like yeah. a single tweet. It yeah. can be the tiniest thing. But I think the important thing there, though, with that is, you're right, it, it, that, was, that was a little spot, but the important thing was you'd carried on writing in the background, you'd actually got something, to yeah. send, I think that's the difference. I think yeah. with a lot of people, I never I think stopped if you, writing. Yeah, I think a lot of people, you know. you know, they do give up unfortunately, and then when that they might get something that's similar to that that might happen, but yeah. they're not in the position that they can actually take advantage of it. That's the difference, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. No, you have to if you're into writing, you have to just you have to keep writing. I think, and and uh, now obviously there comes a time when you might say, okay, that's it, enough. I'm going to get a proper job and you know that, and have a great <laughs> life doing that. But if you have got that spark, I, I, I think yeah, you keep just keep on keeping on, and just you never know, you never know. It only takes one person, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. Spot it. That's it. You don't have to impress a hundred or a thousand people. You just got to impress one person, uh, and just and 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 the luck in any career, it's luck. How you connect to that one person, you know. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So obviously, as, as you said, you were even when you were struggling and uh, you weren't sure whether to carry on or whatever. You obviously still carried on writing. So how did you and do you fit writing around? you know, real life, if you want to call it that, all the other stuff that goes on that's not writing. How do you how do you fit it in? How do you do it? How do you approach it? Have you got like a, do you approach it like an office job? Do you, you know, go <laughs> go there every day and sit down at a certain time and do it? How do you go about yeah. it? Um, as I've said before, it's not difficult for me to start writing. I do love to write. Uh, I absolutely love it. So, but I think... Um, it's like you have to be two things, you know, you have to be a writer and a creative person, but you also have to think of yourself as being a self-employed businessman, yeah, like a sole trader, you know, and I think that side of it, writers really don't want to know about because it's too like, oh, <laughs> that's Lord. The, that's but, the boring bit. Yeah, it is the boring bit, but you have to have that as well. So you need to those two heads, those two hats, you know, and then you can look after your career as well as writing, and so you can keep the two going. Um, how do I fit it in? I, I kind of like, um, I start off nice and easy. You know, I usually leave it off. I like to leave things off at the end of the night as a, like, in the middle of something. Oh, I see, yeah. So you saw them in. Raring to go yeah. the next day sort of thing. Exactly, because there's a big temptation, isn't it? You know, you reach the end of a chapter, you think, okay, yeah, save, right, bedtime or whatever, Yeah. tea time, you know. But if you leave it off, that's an exciting bit that you really want to write, then you come in the morning. You actually just, okay, I can just do that. Whereas starting like, oh, chapter eight, you know, mm. what am I going to do? Yeah. <laughs> it's like the blank page stuff. staring at you. Yeah. So I tend to do that. Um, I work, I don't have set hours or anything. I work intermittently whenever I feel like it. But the, the hours build up every so often during the day. 
That's what I do. And then I relax and then I do it again. So you don't yeah. like have a word count or anything like that specific? No, no I turn the word. Turn it off. You know how many words I've done. You don't want to know. I, 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 I write in single space. I try to make it as look as close to a novel as I can on the screen with mm-hmm. the indents and the single space and, and, and the type font, you know, mm-hmm. as much as possible. I, I try to write it as a novel mm-hmm. so I know what it will look like on the page. Mm. And when I reach 100 pages of doing that, I check the word count for the first time. Right. OK. And I'm usually at that point, say, just over or around about the halfway point depending on how i'm going you know and, you uh, and i think okay yeah and then i turn the word count off again and then i check it when I, like 150 pages and so on that's what i do so, and so what... i don't because i found myself it's like again it's that old getting out of that ego thing you know god i've only written 10 pages you know yeah. i feel like i've written 50 yeah you know yeah. well i was going to ask you that what so obviously if you're not going on the word count or whatever or, or yeah. pages or whatever what what is a good day for you in terms of what how, when you get to the end of a, a writing day and you feel good what is there yeah. is, does it tend to be a set thing that's made you feel like that um yeah writing a really good bit i guess you know yeah yeah <laughs> writing something that you think oh yeah that i enjoyed writing that and uh or, or writing a bit that you think oh I can imagine people reading that and like, yeah, getting it, you know, and that and that kind of feeds you so you can keep going. Because let's face it, writing a novel is a weird thing to do because it's it does take a while. Mm. You are on your own. No, mm. um, you know, it, it is climbing a hill, definitely. Um, and it can seem like a massive hill when you first start. Mm. You know, uh, I mean, it's 100K or whatever, just under, I, got, I tend to do like 90, 95,000. But uh, that's a big lot of words for a single person to write, mm. you know. So anything that helps you to just not to get through that, to keep going, you know. So also the asset, the other thing that happens at some point in the discovery process, I will get this event in my mind some image or something that's going to happen and it's somewhere near the end of the book and i really want to write that bit yeah because i'm very excited to write it you know yeah and so once i've got that i can then i find everything speeds up because i know i'm going towards that point sort of over the brow of the hill sort of thing yeah and you're racing yeah do you ever write you ever write a scene or (laughs) or something and you feel like you really want to tell somebody about it (laughs) because i've had that I could do that, yeah, to my friends, yeah, definitely, definitely. But obviously, I don't they don't even know if they're listening. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't know yeah. if they're listening, but yeah, you I just want to tell them. somebody. Yeah, <laughs> you just want to get it out there. So, uh, a couple of things, just as we kind of move towards um, wrapping up. What What do you think? Obviously, you you mentioned earlier you've kind of, you've you've spoken to younger writers and people coming up and all that. What sort of that sort of stuff? What would you say is the most common mistake? that new writers make that you kind of see? And I'm not on about, it doesn't have to be a technical thing or whatever. I'm, it might be just the way that they approach mm-hmm. it or what they think yeah. or whatever. What would you say is the most common mistake? It's, it, it, it's quite difficult to talk about this because when I mention it, people always look a bit blank eyed. Mm-hmm. So I don't think I'm being very helpful. But when, if people send me stuff to read, you know, and I, uh, and I read it, I have this phrase that I use and I'll say something like, I don't feel like this is written from the inside mm-hmm. of the story. Mm-hmm. Okay. I feel like it's been written from the outside of the story and you're kind of looking at it. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and I find that is quite a difficult thing for like beginning writers to get their heads around mm-hmm. that you have to inhabit the story itself, not just the characters, but the actual story and write it from the inside. It's very difficult to explain unless you've actually been in there, but once you do that, everything starts to happen. The story, the, the, the characters come alive. The story starts to live. It's like, um, because I find that with a lot of writers when they're first beginning, they're like describing stuff. And this isn't show, not tell. It's not that. Mm-hmm. It's related to it. But they're kind of looking at things, like looking at human emotion, say. 
like a, uh, like an alien would look at it rather than yeah, somebody that can actually empathize exactly. and understand it you know yeah. and they'll write sentences like oh he felt really happy mm. for instance yeah which isn't much use to anyone because <laughs> I want to know, I want to be inside that person. Yeah. I want to be feeling what they're feeling yeah. when they're being happy. And I want to know, you know, what's happening. That might happening. just be what, that might be even in dialogue. They could show that. Probably it could be better. dialogue. Yeah. yeah. But I like to actually get in there and start to feel them, you know, yeah. it's like, and express that feeling from the inside rather than just saying he was happy or whatever. So yeah. that's, that's what I've noticed with, uh, is probably for me is the thing that I kind of talk about at the beginning of when people are starting out, yeah. Learning how to write from the inside of the story. Do you think some of that's got to do with, I mean, and I know this is a bit of a generalisation, sweeping generalisation, I'm not saying that every young writer this is the case, but do you think some of that is to do with the fact that they've not lived that much and and so to a certain extent, you know, there is a, there is a, a sense that they're kind of looking from the outside in on some of these things. Yeah, that's a possibility, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think people tend to, it might have changed now, I'm not sure, but when I first started out, a novel was something that you tended to do later on in life. Yeah. Rather than when you were very, kind of like a young person, you know, and I think maybe that's changed a bit now because people expect to be able to write a novel at any age. But because you come, there's that classic kind of first novel syndrome which i definitely had which is that oh you finally get a chance and like there's like 50 years of material <laughs> you know all just goes wham yeah all down and in the same thing that, that's how that's your classic first novel isn't it yeah that's why people love first novels because they've yeah. got that madness in them yeah it's like oh everything's got to go on everything everything that, that was definitely that with with me um so yeah you need to build that up don't you you need to and also remember i started out from playwriting yeah that was my first thing so that's a very specific set of talent there that's a set of tools it's different than novel writing it's very much to do with dialogue uh you know when you're writing a play if somebody says i feel happy you can bet your bottom bottom dog that person's lying exactly yeah you see what i mean because totally, that's what yeah. plays are about yeah totally yeah yeah when you write a play, it's very obvious that that's, that's what's really going on. But in a novel, you have to bring that to the novel as well, that not everyone's telling the truth, you know, and especially in a crime novel. Yeah. I mean, it's it's weird writing crime, like writing a traditional crime novel, because you just think, this person's lying. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> they have to believe in it completely and utterly. They do, and I think the difference, as you say, yeah. between drama and uh a novel to a certain extent is obviously that's the element of in in the writing of a play it's kind of implicit and it's something that the uh, uh, you know if the writing's good then the actors will be able to bring that out but with a novel you're kind of having to you you're kind of the actor and you're the director and you're the writer in, in a novel you're kind of playing all those parts aren't you so you've got to make sure that that's that you get you, you're communicating what you want to get across yeah you have to take. You're you to wear all those hats, aren't you? And yeah, and also, of course, you've got description, which is the other thing that you don't have in drama. You've got, you yeah. know, you've got voice, you've got character, you've got narrative, you've got location. You've got like just juggling all that stuff, you know. But it's it's um, people often say, I, I mean, I start from a situation, not a character. Okay, so some people have this different ways of doing it. So I, my characters tend to, like, arise out of the situation. I see. Uh, and then they grow from there. Um, you know, and, and sometimes I'll start from a really simple thing, you know, like in, in when, I, when I wrote A Man of Shadows, I just thought, I had this situation, I thought, who's the worst possible person? to face this and i invented nyquist just out of that you know i mean <laughs> it's a, a simple point, start yeah. yeah yeah it's simple but <clears throat> he's created by the situation just like we are in real life um yeah because sometimes as you say a lot of people would do it the other way around they would think well this is this particular character and now what's the worst thing for that character to face you're kind of <laughs> well, you're yeah, kind that's... of you're kind of working it back the other way yeah. Yeah, character is a big subject. I mentioned Stephen King before. If people ask me about, you know, about character and writing character, I always direct them to King because I think he's really, really good at character. And I think that's one of the major reasons why people love him so much. Mm -hmm. 
And he has this thing where if you imagine a kind of uh, a spectrum where at one end you've got, say, Agatha Christie, Mm -hmm. okay, and at the other end you've got some, like, highfalutin literary Booker Prize winning writer, okay? (laughs) They are very different views of what character is. Yeah. Uh, Both completely and utterly legitimate in their own way. Uh, But King operates in the middle, you know, uh-huh. And he can bring a character. So he's not like making a, a really heavy, heavy, heavy character that's got lots of detail on it. Because I get really bored with that kind of character. Mm. And he's not doing that classic dichotomy that you get in a Christie novel where, you know, the the colonel with his medals is actually a coward. You know, that yeah, kind of dichotomy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not that uh, old. He's not on the nose. Some, yeah, he's somewhere in the middle of that. And he, he knows how to tell a, a good backstory. Yeah. Very simple. Doesn't weigh it down. It just tells the correct bat story, which is always interesting and it gives you that story of character and then you can move on with it. So I always you know, talk about character in, it sort of gives you just enough. Way. Just enough, yeah. So if you were starting st- starting again tomorrow as a new writer, what, if anything, do you think you'd do differently? Or what would you go back and tell your younger self, do you think? Oh God, I can't imagine what it must be like to start today. I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, the internet, you know, what do yeah, you do with that? True. Oh, the temporary cultural values. What on earth do you do with them if you just started out? I have no idea at all. I can't imagine it. It was it was a lot simpler, I think, back then. You you wrote a book and you prayed and you hoped <laughs> that somebody somewhere would publish it, you know. Uh, so do you think your days, advice I... would be probably just not to do it? <laughs> No, no, <laughs> but the internet has changed it, definitely, because everyone now, and also like the Kindle, for instance, Yeah, you know, uh, you get all those Kindle novels, don't you, out thousands of them. Yeah. So I think these days you have to raise your flag high, mm-hmm. as high as you can, make sure your flag has got a unique design on it. I'm basically saying create a unique voice for yourself because the marketplace is so massive now and so saturated it's easy to get lost and it's easy to just sink in it uh the stronger your voice the stronger your story the, the more unique your story is the more unique your subject matter is uh i think the better chance you've got that's 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 the advice I would give, you know, in these days. I don't know. It's, it's 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 interesting. I know people are doing lots of different kinds of writing online, but if you're talking about the traditional mm. the classic novel, yeah, yeah, you, you have to stand out in some way these days. Well, that's yeah. really good advice. So, kind of as we as we wrap it up, then. So, just can you just give us a a bit of a sense of uh, what's up next, and also tell us where people can find out more about you online. You mentioned Twitter there as well. Yeah, Twitter's the best. Uh, at Jeff Noon, that's where uh, I do quite every so often. I'll do some little tiny Twitter like stories on there as well. If I'm in the mood, like little tiny little stories, like little flash uh, fiction, but on Twitter, yeah, like minute things. Yeah, uh, I haven't done, done them for a bit, but every so often, oh god, I'm writing a fantasy novel at the moment, which really? is quite interesting. It's going to be a collaborative novel, great, which I'm writing with my friend Steve, Steve Beard, another writer, yeah. Uh, so we've been working on that. Um, that's been quite difficult because, you know, it's like uh, we can't really get together that much anymore. Yeah, it's tricky, isn't it? In the minute. I know. Mm. So we were walking around the park today and it was just wasn't like great because it was freezing. Mm. And, uh, so you don't, but you, can't, you don't do Zooms or Skypes or anything like that then? No, we might do in the future. But up to now, we've been like, it's been working OK. But we've done quite a lot of that. We've got, we've created a world. We created this city called Ludwich. We created this city called Ludwich and we populated it with these eight different tribes, all with their own religions, their own science, their own magic. We we wrote the history of the city going back to Stone Age times. Wow. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it's like a science fiction fantasy city. Uh, and finally, you know, about, about a year ago, we started to actually sit down and say, well, let's write a story in Ludwig. Let's see what happens. So I've been working on that. That's my big project at the moment. Exciting stuff. Yeah. yeah. Well, best of luck with it and best of luck with the latest book as well, which is uh, which is out pretty much right now by the time this podcast comes out anyway. Um, but uh, for now, Jeff, it's been great to talk to you. So thanks for coming on Joined Up Writing. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Joined up writing 
There you go. Thanks again to Jeff Noon, whose book House With No Doors is available right now. And I'll put all of those links in the show notes over at joinedupwriting.co.uk. That pretty much wraps it up for this week, and I'll give you a week off from playing any more of my songs. Maybe I'll chuck in another one next week after my interview with Benjamin Cross. But anyway, don't forget you can find the entire back catalogue of interviews on the website. Make sure you subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Overcast, or wherever else you get your podcasts to have the podcast downloaded automatically every week. Also remember to leave us a nice rating and review on Apple Podcasts because it really does help others to find the show or recommend it to one of your friends. Other than that, thanks for listening. I'm Wayne Kelly. Happy writing, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.